Welcome to the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare module, What Works for Addiction and Child Welfare. This module is presented by Dr. Amy Krensman and PhD student Karen Goodenough. My name is Nikki Tillman. I'm an MSW student and will be introducing your presenters and an overview of the module content. First and foremost, we'd like to extend our gratitude for the amazing work each and every one of you do every day for children and families. Your work is appreciated. We hope this module will be beneficial in your continuing efforts. Our first presenter is Dr. Amy Krensman, pictured here on the left in blue. She is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work. Dr. K does research on addiction recovery, specifically studying the link between recovery and spirituality, gratitude, and forgiveness. She also looks at recovery in the context of 12-step programs and sober living houses. She is currently doing a study on recovery in rural Minnesota. In addition to research, Dr. K teaches a course in the Masters of Social Work program about substance use disorder. Our second presenter is Karen Goodenough, MSW and LGSW. Karen is a PhD student, community faculty member, and research assistant at the University of Minnesota. She is also a principal consultant at Strategic Consulting and Coaching, a firm located in St. Paul, Minnesota, and she works in macro social work through enhancing nonprofit leadership and management, evaluation and data-driven practice and decision-making, and consulting on strategic planning, fundraising, budgeting, and program development. Her research interests focus on addiction, child welfare, and social workers working in fundraising and philanthropy. As part of her research, Karen has collaborated with Dr. K on a study of rural recovery, as well as completed a literature review about addiction and child welfare, which will be presented at the end of this module as a resource. In 2016 and 2017, Dr. K and Karen presented a module on addiction and child welfare as an overview for child welfare workers. This current module will focus on interventions and how child welfare workers can work more effectively with addiction and recovery. As a review, let's look at what the module in 2016-2017 covered about addiction and child welfare. The Addiction and Child Welfare module concentrated on the following areas. What is addiction? The conversation about addiction and child welfare. Brain science of addiction. Prevalence of substance use in child welfare involved families. The impact on families and the child welfare system of addiction. And finally, what is recovery? For a review of this information, the module is still available on the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare's YouTube channel. So as a review, in 2016-2017, Karen and Dr. K talked about the problem, addiction, and the child welfare system. For this module, they will be talking about the solution, what works for addiction and child welfare. Therefore, this module for 2017-2016 will move the conversation further and looks at what works for child welfare and addiction. Let's take a look at what will be covered in the following module by Dr. Krensman and Karen. Dr. K will begin the module with a discussion of the different interventions that work well for addiction. The discussion will begin with the screening tools for addiction and then assessment. Following that, Dr. K will discuss the concept of harm reduction as an effective intervention, as well as acute stabilization and withdrawal management. Finally, Dr. K will cover effective psychosocial counseling strategies that work well for addiction. The three psychosocial counseling strategies that Dr. K will discuss that are effective for addiction are cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, motivational interviewing, and 12-step facilitation. It should be noted 12-step facilitation is not the same as 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous. Finally, Karen will discuss more specifically what works well for addiction in child welfare. She will cover addiction interventions in child welfare as well as addiction policies in child welfare that affect your work with children and families. 
Karen also completed a comprehensive literature review on addiction and child welfare. She will present that lit review and the review is available to everyone as a resource for further information. We will now move into the main content of the module, beginning with Dr. Krenzer. We begin with the first section, What Works for Addiction. I want to start this discussion by telling you what happened to me at a dinner party I went to recently. I went to a dinner party. There weren't that many people there, maybe half a dozen people, but for whatever reason, because of the flow of traffic through the living room and the dining room, three different people asked me what I do for a living. I told them I do research on addiction and addiction recovery, and three separate people at three different points asked me what works for addiction. And I had to repeat myself three different times. If they had only asked me once when everyone was present, I would have only had to do it once. But I had to repeat myself three times uh, at this particular dinner party. So what that led to was it led to a certain kind of an insight that occurred to me, which is that really what works for addiction is that the individual with the addiction should completely stop the addictive behavior and stay stopped for all the days of the rest of their lives. That's what works for addiction. But of course, that's incredibly uh, unrealistic because doing that, I mean, that does describe the nature of addiction recovery, but getting there is so incredibly difficult that the si situation is clearly uh, uh, not that simple to the point of being comical. So my students, when I told them this story, they said to me, how did you answer? When they asked you that three different times, three different people at that dinner party, how did you answer? And um, I answered by describing the evidence-based psychosocial interventions that are used to initiate and support abstinence. That's the way that I chose to answer the question. I talked about cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, and 12-step facilitation, kind of uh, looking at those three approaches and rooting out their main philosophies and that's basically how I answered it. Now don't worry too much about what I just rattled off because the main point of this part of the module is for me to explain in more depth how cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, and 12-step facilitation work for addiction. So that's coming in this module. But my students pointed out that the, an the real answer really is um, it depends. So someone asked you what works for addiction and a better answer almost than the one I gave is it depends. What works for addiction depends on the individual. It depends on the individual's readiness to change. You might be familiar with stages of change theory, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. What works for addiction depends on the stage at which an individual is along a continuum of problematic substance use. The person might have some substance use that's risky but is not, um, does not meet, yet meet criteria for, for an addictive behavior. And the way that you respond to that will vary depending on where they are in that continuum. There's also a continuum of severity once the person has crossed that threshold and they meet criteria for an addiction. So depending on their level of severity in the sphere of addictive behavior, that will dictate what works best for them. And that might mean, for example, outpatient versus inpatient versus residential. So to summarize this slide, what works for addiction depends on a lot of different criteria and, fact, criteria and factors related to the individual. What works for addiction also depends on what is the addictive substance or what is the addictive behavior. For example, for opioid use disorders, there's a choice whether to recommend abstinence, 100% abstinence from the addictive substance, or to rec recommend a replacement therapy, such as methadone or buprenorphine. With alcohol use disorder, the recommendation would be more abstinence-based because there aren't any replacement therapies yet for alcohol use disorder. But the person could be prescribed naltrexone, which could help decrease their craving. So another thing that works for addiction depends on what is the addictive substance or behavior. Another thing that works for addiction it are policies that influence the larger social environment. So for example, in Portugal, illegal drugs have been decriminalized, reducing rates of problematic use, 
harm and the burden on the criminal justice system. So policy change like that would work for addiction. Um, that also, there's a lot of research being conducted that can inform policy changes that can have an impact on addiction for everyone in society. And just two examples of such research, there was a study that showed that exposure to pro-smoking media re led to higher future smoking risk. And another study, just as two examples, that increases in the price of alcoholic drinks were associated with fewer subsequent alcohol-related deaths in a community, and increases in the number of liquor stores in a community were associated with greater alcohol-related deaths in a community. So one other thing that works for addiction are policies. So in, in part, it depends on what level you're looking at, level of the individual or level of all of society. But what we're going to talk about in this um, webinar are um, these several items, screening, assessment, harm reduction, acute stabilization and withdrawal management. And then we're going to really focus in depth on three psychosocial counseling strategies. These are the ones I, met, I mentioned earlier. So we'll start with screening. You might be familiar with this term that has emerged from the addiction field in recent years called pronounced ESPERT. It's, it, it stands for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. The idea behind ESPERT is that in the past, all of the resources devoted to addiction were uh, uh, targeted toward the individuals who became so severely impaired by addiction that they were, um, it was recommended for them to enter treatment. And in this data graphic in this pyramid, it's the, the top 4% of society, those who are most severely addicted who go into treatment, and all the focus was on them. Now skip down to the blue part of the pyramid. 70% of the population are abstainers or low-risk drinkers, and for them, there's no need uh, to worry, except they could be provided with positive reinforcement. But what we were missing as an addiction treatment field, we were missing the 25% of the population who are risky drinkers. These people, research has subsequently shown, can really benefit from brief interventions. And it can help them from becoming alcohol dependent and entering that 4%. But we weren't addressing that 25% of the population. So screening to see where people fall in these, for example, in these three categories is something really helpful that can help with addiction overall. The World Health Organization recommends that medical patients should be screened for alcohol problems annually. So when a person goes for their annual checkup to the doctor, they should receive a one question screening. And that question is, according to research, how many times in the past year have you had four or more drinks in one day if you're a woman or five or more drinks in a day if you're a man? If the person says that in the past year there was at least one day when they drank four or more drinks in a single day, then they would have considered getting a positive uh, result to that screen and they'd move on to a screening that is more involved, such as the alcohol use disorders test. The alcohol use disorders test is also called the audit. It was developed to screen for excessive drinking, to help identify people who would benefit from reduced or ceasing their drinking, and it assesses risky or hazardous drinking, alcohol use disorders, and harmful drinking. The audit was developed and evaluated over two decades. It's accurate across age, gender, and multiple cultures worldwide. It was developed and tested in six countries among 2,000 patients, Norway, Australia, Kenya, Bulgaria, Mexico, and US. To me, this is very impressive that the instrument, the questionnaire, the audit questionnaire was normed in several very different cultural groups to make sure that it was not biased for North Americans. Subsequently, the audit has been translated into numerous other languages.
The audit has been identified as one of the best screening instruments for the whole range of alcohol problems in primary care, and the total score positively correlates with severity of the alcohol problem. And the nice thing about the audit is depending on what the person scores, there's a prescription for what the social worker should do. If the person scores between zero and seven, the person should get alcohol education. If the person scores between eight and 15 on the audit, they should get simple advice focused on reduction of hazardous drinking. If the person scores between 16 and 19 on the audit, they should get simple advice, brief, brief counseling, and continued monitoring. If they score over 20, then they're a person who should get a referral to a specialist for diagnostic evaluation and probable subsequent treatment. So just to summarize the previous section, one thing that works really well for addiction is adequate and accurate screening and then appropriate response to a whole range of spectrum of, of drinking behaviors. Another thing that uh, works for addiction is accurate and comprehensive assessment. So let's say someone has scored over a 20 on the audit and they move on to the comprehensive psychosocial assessment. I wanna talk about one such assessment that we call the Rule 25 here in the state of Minnesota, and it's based on the American Society of Addiction Medicine Dimensions of Assessment. These dimensions are six dimensions, they're multidimensional, and their aim is for holistic biopsychosocial assessment and to be used for service planning and treatment. So this is when your client scores a 20 or above on the audit and then they go in for maybe like an hour long conversation with an expert substance use disorder um, counselor who will do this comprehensive assessment ac across six dimensions of the individual's life. One, an assessment for acute intoxication. Are they in jeopardy of imminent withdrawal symptoms? Dimension two, their health and medical complications and concerns beyond addiction. And dimension three, emotional, behavioral, cognitive conditions and complications, such as depression, suicidality, physical violence, history of abuse, mental health, and historical trauma. Dimension four, their, the client's readiness to change. Dimension five, relapse, continued use, and continued problem potential. That would be difficulty quitting in the past, cravings, and history of previous treatment. And finally, dimension six, the person's environment, the current life environment, and its suitability for sustained recovery. Is the person employed? What are their social connections? Who lives at home? Are they people who use or don't use substances? What is their housing like and what is the neighborhood like? So the counselor would sit down with the person and assess the person for all six of those dimensions. And then they would use this really nice grid where after each, assessing for each dimension, they would rate the person based on their severity. If you look on the left-hand side of this grid, you see a severity from zero to four and they rate the person on each dimension going across from left to right. And um, if the person scores a level four with any of the first three dimensions, then the interview is stopped and the person is referred immediately for uh, services, either withdrawal services or emergency psychiatric services. That's um, if the person is um, very, in very, very ill health and, and is not well enough actually to complete this the, the, um, the screening, the assessment rather. If the person scores on dimension um, four, five, or six with a severity rating of two, three, or four, then they're deemed to be eligible for treatment. So this whole package is a really good way for the assessment person to um, do an in-depth and comprehensive assessment and then to get guidance for what would be the best thing for that person. Harm reduction is also something that works for addiction. Strategies for harm reduction include outreach and, uh, and education, needle exchange programs, and naloxone, which you might be familiar with, is also called Narcan. This is a harm reduction approach when a person has effectively overdosed. If they could get a dose of this drug, 
it will reverse the effects of the overdose and the person will recover and be able to um, survive and not, and not um, uh, you know, be faced with life-threatening um, overdose. Another thing that works for addiction is acute stabilization and withdrawal management. This is also called detox. It's medically stabilized withdrawal from a substance when medical professionals are observing and also managing the person as they withdraw. But it's important to know that by itself, it's not effective as treatment. The person should um, have medically stabilized withdrawal and if they need it and then go on for treatment. All by itself, it's not effective, um, but it is an important step in what works for addiction. Now I'm going to move on to really the heart of um, this part of the module, which is to go in a little bit of depth on three psychosocial counseling strategies that work for addiction based on um, a great deal of research. I'm going to be talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, and 12-step facilitation as three different psychosocial strategies. We'll start with cognitive behavioral therapy. You may have been already introduced to CBT and this might be a review, but Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis were trained as psychoanalysts but in their training and in their work as psychoanalysts, they realized that thinking played a role in a person's behavior and emotions. And if you could change the person's thinking, you could change their behavior and their emotions. So therefore, they developed a theory focusing on thoughts, and that theory became CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It's important to remember that Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is a giant umbrella under which there are several other kinds of therapies that are also CBT therapies. You might have heard of coping skills therapy or dialectical behavior therapy. These are parts of, these are forms of CBT. It's important when you consider what is CBT to remember that thinking is really essential a person's thinking and thought processes are essential. And you can think of thinking as a mediator, a mediator of the effect of an event in the world on a person's behavior and emotion. So the little, the little guy moving his hand, that represents action or behavior, and the heart represents emotion. And the effect of the event on how the person will act and respond to it or feel and respond to the event is mediated by what they think about the event. They might have irrational thoughts related to the event, which would lead to behaviors that are not helpful or emotions that are not helpful. They might have automatic thoughts uh, in relationship to the event or negative self-talk in relationship to the event. These things would skew the subsequent behaviors and emotions. You might have heard the expression, life is 10% what happens and 90% what you make of it. This idea is essential to CBT, that the 90% of what you make of what happens can influence your behavior and your emotions. And um, this uh, illustration is, um, suggests that it's not the event, but the perception of the event that, that is problematic for people. And problematic thinking is often not reality-based and not helpful. These last two slides I credit to Kerry Belden, PhD at the University of Nebraska. So if you're treating someone with CBT, you might have them keep a log of what happens, that is the event, and how they respond to it. For example, suppose a store clerk doesn't smile at the person when they pay for their purchase. That's the event. And if the person has some negative self-talk or some dysfunctional thoughts, they could make that mean that nobody likes them, that they look awful, that, um, that they're a bad person or that they'll never um, improve, nothing will ever get better for them. But if they can use CBT, they can think that of alternative 
pathways, like maybe the clerk was having a bad day or maybe she never smiles at customers. And this can help them uh, feel better and um, respond to events in a different way. So the question is, what does CBT look like when it's applied to addiction treatment? One way that CBT is very relevant for addictions is this idea of high risk situations. These will vary from person to person, but if a person is in um, a treatment setting for addiction, they are going to, if CBT is used, and this is what's recommended, they're going to be helped to identify for them what constitutes a high risk situation in the environment that's going to be a very strong trigger for them to use the substance or to relapse. And in summary, that could be people, places, or things. So the counselor helps the person to identify who are the people, what are the places or settings, and what are the things that you associate so strongly with using substance that these things could help, could, could uh, effectively trigger a relapse. And the per person identifies these and um, comes up with strategies for uh, dealing with them in the environment. Another aspect of CBT and addiction is the idea of role play, practice, and homework. So the counselor will rehearse strategies for coping with high risk situations with the client. Maybe the counselor will play the role of um, the client first in one of these high risk settings and then the role switch and, the, and in the, the therapy session, the, the client will then practice what will happen when they see these person these people who are high risk for them or when they're in the environment that are high risk or how do you avoid these uh, environments altogether. Another aspect of CBT and addictions is this idea of cravings. So craving for addiction can lead to relapse, craving for the substance. And there's a CBT strategy called urge surfing, which invites the person to observe the craving and not react to it and to ride the wave of the craving until it passes. Another thing that happens in CBT and addictions is the idea of challenging negative thinking. For example, quote, I need cocaine to get through the day. I need to be intoxicated or I won't be attractive. Smoking makes me look cool. These are neg negative cognitions that can be challenged using CBT. Another thing that works for CBT and addictions is this idea of positive incentives. This is also called the community reinforcement approach. And the idea is that the client might win a prize for clean urines. Maybe they spin a wheel and they get a small prize if they have um, presented a um, urine test that has come out clean for drugs. And this has shown to really help support people in early recovery and help them build and put together days of abstinence. Another thing that happens with CBT and addictions is attention to life skills that will help the person's life be better and more functional and so they don't use drugs and alcohol as coping mechanisms. So there might be class sessions where skills are learned about starting conversations with strangers, nonverbal communication, assertiveness, what to do if someone criticizes you, and anger management. So in summary, CBT for addiction includes things like attention and focus on high-risk situations and how to cope with them, role-playing, practice and homework, urge surfing for cravings for using the substance, challenging dysfunctional behaviors and thoughts related to substance use, positive incentives, and learning additional life skills. We'll move on now from CBT to motivational interviewing. I recommend this text, the third edition of Motivational Interviewing, Helping People Change. It's really well written, it's clear, and it really describes motivational interviewing extremely well. Motivational interviewing started in Norway in 1982. Bill Miller was in Norway and his students asked him, what are you doing with clients? Can you describe it? He was teaching and working in a substance abuse treatment program. 
And he answered he was using a Rogerian approach, but with a twist. And the twist was motivational interviewing. To understand motivational interviewing, one thing that's important to understand is the word ambivalence. Someone shows ambivalence when they have conflicting feelings about something. Ambivalence is very common in addiction. That's when someone really, really wants to stop smoking cigarettes and they really, really don't want to stop smoking cigarettes. Originally a psychological term, ambivalence was borrowed from the German word, which meant in two ways and vigor and strength. It means you feel two opposite ways at the same time. You use motivational interviewing when two things are present. One, when there's ambivalence about change, when the person really wants to change, but they also really don't want to change. And second, when there's a targeted behavior change that has been identified. For example, reduction of use of social media, drinking less coffee, cutting down on sweets, or exercising more. When you have a targeted behavior change that the person feels ambivalent about, you can roll out the motivational interviewing. And when you think about it, addiction recovery is all about ambivalence and it's all about behavior change. So therefore the fit with motivational interviewing. A definition of motivational interviewing is that it is a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment to change. One core of motivational interviewing is the idea of motivational interviewing spirit, which is rooted in the work of Carl Rogers, who is the psychologist who said that unconditional positive regard, empathy, and genuineness is all that's needed to be helpful to another human being. In motivational interviewing, they've changed some of the language slightly. They talk about acceptance, collaboration, evocation, and compassion. Motivational interviewing's core skills are called ORs, O for open-ended questions, A for affirmations, R for reflective listening, and S for summaries. And I would add that a core skill in motivational interviewing is also asking permission of the client. There are four processes of motivational interviewing that basically follow the basic problem solving model, engagement, focusing, evoking, and planning. The novel step here is evoking, that you evoke from the client their own innate reasons for change. The main heart of motivational interviewing is the idea that you're navigating the landscape of client dialogue and it's client talk along the lines of change talk and sustain talk. And you as the counselor are navigating the client's change talk and sustain talk and that is motivational interviewing. Change talk and sustain talk can be identified along sort of this two by two table presented here on the slide. Good things related to making the change good things related to staying the same, bad things related to making the change, and bad things related to staying the same. An individual could probably come up with a list under all four of these categories if they are considering a behavior change, especially one they feel ambivalent about. Let's look at an example. Let's say that target behavior is exercise. Good things related to making the change would be I like how it feels to exercise. My clothes will fit better. I will feel more confident. Good things related to staying the same are, well, I could rest and relax. I could do what I want when I want to. And I can use the valuable time I'd spend at the gym doing other important things. Bad things related to making the change include the gym is expensive, exercise hurts, and the whole thing is a hassle. Bad things related to staying the same include lack of exercise could turn into a bad health issue and I get winded when I climb the stairs and I don't like that. So a client who's considering change, in this case exercising, in talking to you, the counselor, they could 
have things that they say that fall into all four of these boxes. And the thing with motivational interviewing is to remember that when people talk about good things related to making the change or bad things related to staying the same, that that kind of language is called change talk. And when, pe and when the client talks about good things related to staying the same or bad things related to making the change, that kind of language is called sustained talk. Sustained talk is any client speech that favors the status quo, no change specific to a target behavior. And one of your tasks as a clinician doing motivational interviewing is being able to discern change talk from sustained talk and then doing different things in the face of it. Traversing the landscape of sustained talk and change talk are the heart of the craft of motivational interviewing. Basically, as the counselor, you want to evoke change talk, maximize it, and de-emphasize sustained talk. How does motivational interviewing work? People who are ambivalent have within them the reasons, arguments, and motivations for change. It's already in there within them. It's better to draw the innate motivation for change out of the person than impose it on them from the outside. Motivational interviewing uses a conversational strategy which draws out a person's innate motivation for change. It does this by interacting with a type of naturally occurring speech called change talk. What is change talk? Uh, we talked about that actually earlier in the slide. It's the um, reasons they would articulate that favor change. And as the counselor, you would intentionally evoke or bring forward change talk. How would you do that? First, you'd learn to recognize it when it naturally occurs, and then you'd encourage it. You'd become very interested in it. You'd ask the person to elaborate on it. As uh, the person, you'd ask the person to provide examples of it, and you'd put your oars into it. You'd ask open-ended questions to elicit more change talk. You'd affirm the change talk. You'd reflect it, and you'd summarize it. Basically, you'd pour miracle grow on the change talk that the client offers. You'd pour the warm sunlight of your attention onto the change talk. But what do you do when you hear sustained talk? You honor it, but you don't reflect it by itself and you don't elicit it. So you don't say to someone, what, what's good about lying on the couch all day and eating as much of whatever you want. You wouldn't say that. That would not be motivational interviewing. You wouldn't say to the client, what do you love most about smoking? You could use a skill called a double-sided reflection where you reflect the sustained talk first and then reflect change talk. You could use an amplified reflection where um, the, you reflect the sustained talk but in an exaggerated way and you emphasize that the person is ultimately responsible for whatever choice they make about their lives. You, so you'd emphasize that their control and personal choice. So in the previous slides, I listed actually rather quickly a, a set of skills that the counselor uses to elicit change talk and de-emphasize sustained talk. And those are learned more slowly as someone is trained in motivational interviewing. So what makes motivational interviewing especially good for addiction? Here I'm going to quote from my notes from a lecture I heard recently with, from um, an expert in addiction named John Renner. He said, people with addictions have had their self-esteem destroyed. They feel defeated. Don't give up on them. He says, when meeting a client with addiction, assume the person is depressed, assume their self-esteem is zero, and be very gentle with them. And I feel that these comments from my notes from hearing this lecture by John Renner really suggest that motivational interviewing would be a way that would be a very gentle and affirming way to work with people who feel very sensitive and very, um, very damaged by their experience with substances. Summary of motivational interviewing for addiction. Use motivational interviewing when two things are present, ambivalence about change and an identified change behavior. 
Motivational interviewing spirit is rooted in the work of Carl Rogers. It has to do with eliciting the client's innate motivation for change. And um, you navigate the landscape of speech related to change talk and sustain talk offered by the client. This is the third psychosocial intervention I will describe in this module. It is 12-step facilitation. The first thing I want to emphasize is that there's a difference between 12-step facilitation as a professional counseling technique and Alcoholics Anonymous or 12-step programs that exist in the community. So maybe the first thing to do is introduce what is Alcoholics Anonymous and then what is 12-step facilitation in um, contrast to it. Alcoholics Anonymous is a voluntary worldwide organization of individuals who meet to attain and maintain sobriety. The only requirement is the desire to stop drinking. It is free of charge. It emphasizes total abstinence rather than reducing drinking. The meetings are run not by professionals, but by recovering individuals. It's extremely widespread and accessible with thousands and thousands of groups and over 2 million members in 170 countries worldwide. 86.7% of countries on earth have AA meetings. There's been in research a very robust relationship found between the effect of AA and up on drinking. And that's any way that AA is measured, AA attendance, AA involvement, and any way that drinking is measured, percent days abstinent, um, drinks per drinking day, and any time lapse, whether it's a month or six months or eight years, Alcoholics Anonymous has an effect on reducing drinking. So 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous exist in the community and have nothing to do with professional treatment. But 12-step facilitation is something different. 12-step facilitation is a professional treatment approach. 12-step facilitation happens in the context of substance use disorder treatment settings. Again, it's not part of Alcoholics Anonymous. It varies widely, but what does not vary about it is that 12-step facilitation builds a bridge from professional treatment settings to 12-step meetings in the community so that the client can easily walk over that bridge. It actively prescribes and recommends AA meetings while the person is undergoing professional treatment. It may also um, help the person actually do some of their step work. So 12-step programs have 12 su suggested behavioral and attitudinal steps. And with your professional counselor in treatment, the client may work step one, step two, step three, step two, four, or step five. 12-step facilitation may look a little bit differently. For example, an approach called MAZE, which stands for Making Alcoholics Anonymous Easier, a set of researchers developed a manual guided intervention, which is a 12-step facilitation approach, with four core sessions that focus on spirituality, principles not personalities, sponsorship, and living sober, which are accompanied by weekly homework assignments. Some of the homework assignments include talking to someone else at a meeting, um, getting someone's phone number, socializing with someone from a meeting, or seeking advice of someone who has more sober time, including getting a temporary sponsor. There are some treatment programs that primarily use a 12-step facilitation approach. For example, Dawn Farm, which is a treatment program in Ypsilanti, Michigan, um, as its motto, there in the smaller type, they identify and remove barriers that prevent addicts and alcoholics from joining the recovery community. So basically, they're all about helping people to bridge with that recovery community, uh, recovery support group that will help support them for, for all the rest of their lives, really. 
here in Minnesota, there's a similar um, treatment program called the Retreat, which similarly um, uses a model where they don't employ professional counselors, but they employ individuals in the community who are already successfully sober to come in and work with the people who are uh, seeking recovery in the treatment program. And even for addictions outside of alcohol and drugs, um, this idea of 12-step facilitation has been used. For example, again in Minnesota, there's something called Core Retreat, which is for food recovery. And this is one where people are invited to um, consider successful strategies that will work after they complete the five-day retreat where they affiliate with Overeaters Anonymous in the community. So a summary of 12-step facilitation. 12-step facilitation strategies are not the same as 12-step programs like AA. Treatment programs that use 12-step facilitation appro approaches are not part of AA or other 12-step programs. 12-step facilitation approaches help people transition to 12-step programs in the community. And sometimes whole treatment programs use 12-step facilitation as their primary approach. We'll now switch in to covering some of what works for addiction specifically as interventions in child welfare. Just to ground us a little bit, I want to go back to some slides from an earlier module that we presented that talks about the prevalence of substance abuse in child welfare. We know from the research that the statistics vary widely and that there's no standardized national data collection on this topic at this point. But what we have found is that an estimated one-third to two-thirds of all maltreatment cases are affected to some degree. So one-third to two-thirds of those cases that you are working with in child welfare are being affected by substance abuse. Others estimate that substance abuse is a factor in about 15% of investigations of child welfare and about 25% of substantiated cases. So you could find that if you're an ongoing child welfare worker, that anywhere from one third to two thirds or around 25% of those that you're serving are um, affected by, by substance abuse. Of those children who are in out of home care, we've found that 61% of infants and about 41% of older children are from families affected by substance abuse. Now continuing, the discussion of what works for addiction and now talking about addiction and child welfare, I want to start with child welfare casework practices. So these are things that work for addiction that are specifically um, how you work with families that are struggling with addiction. So the first thing you can do is understand substance abuse, the signs, effects on parenting, and what to expect during treatment and recovery, which is what these modules have been about. Another has to do with family engagement, and this is helping to motivate families to enter and remain in substance abuse services and address their individual needs, including previous trauma history and family needs such as childcare and transportation, things that could affect their ability to do well um, in substance abuse treatment and recovery. Others include routine screening and assessment, so using brief validated culturally appropriate tools to identify problems and help connect people to appropriate um, substance abuse services. Another is individual treatment and case plans, so really looking at the individual needs of each person um, that you're serving. Another thing that works in casework practices is supporting parents, so helping parents to build coping and parenting skills and learn to pay attention to their own triggers for substance abusing behaviors. In 2009, a research study by Lewandowski and Hill found that child welfare support impacted women's treatment completion. So your work in supporting parents can really impact their ability to complete treatment and get the support and recovery that they need. Another is supporting children. So we know that the effects on children are significant and engaging children with behavioral and mental health professionals to meet their individual needs and potential risk 
for substance abuse themselves are really important pieces of casework practice. Another is concurrent permanency planning. So to achieve timely permanency, planning concurrently for both reunification as well as an alternative plan in case re reunification is not possible. We'll talk a bit later about a more um, extensive literature review that will describe a large section of research devoted to uh, many of these practices if you'd like to read more about the outcomes of each of these specific interventions. Another part of what works for addiction and child welfare is prevention and treatment approaches. So there's many approaches that have been shown to be successful in child welfare. One is promoting protective factors, the social connections, supports, and parenting knowledge that helps people do well um, in their addiction recovery. Another is identifying early, those screening efforts to get services to families quickly, timely access to treatment, and whenever possible, getting priority access for mothers in the child welfare system. Gender sensitive treatment, specifically to meet the needs of mothers and potential co-occurring issues that um, people of different genders um, face and family-centered treatment, where mothers can have their children with them in treatment and where services are provided to all of the family members, not just the mother, but the children as well. Another approach that works is recovery coaches and mentoring, and that's to support treatment and recovery and parenting and having folks who people can look to as guides and examples of um, folks who've done well in treatment and recovery. And another is shared family care, and that is placing um, families with a host family for support and mentoring. Many large-scale efforts have also been made across the country and around the world towards systems change and collaboration between child welfare and substance abuse treatment and recovery systems. One of these is family treatment drug courts. This is a cross-system approach that's shown great success in treatment access, completion, and family reunification. Another is cross-training, so having both substance abuse and child welfare professionals understand the needs and services in each of those systems. Another is co-location, or having substance abuse professionals on-site in child welfare agencies. There's also information sharing, which many of us do in our work every day, but making sure that we have signed agreements with families to ensure that there's communications between their systems to best meet the needs of children and families in a timely way. And some areas are even using linked data systems to track progress and shared goals of the families that they're working with across these systems. Another is joint planning and case management to help families not get overwhelmed with their multiple goals and our multiple systems that are disconnected. And another is wraparound services or meeting the needs of multiple needs, meeting the multiple needs of parents and children, including their mental health, substance abuse, parenting, housing, employment, education, childcare, and domestic violence, and having all of these services in place and connected and talking to each other whenever possible. So another area of what works for addiction and child welfare are policies related to addiction and child welfare. So 47 states and the District of Columbia address aspects of parental substance abuse in their child protection laws. The Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997 limited the time until a permanency decision is made. And this really got our child welfare system moving rather quickly. Um, in terms of finding permanent homes for children. A study of pre-post child welfare outcomes, so pre the Adoption and Safe Families Act and post, found that there's less time in foster care, quicker permanent placement, and, more, and children are more likely to be adopted than remain in long-term foster care. However, rates of reunification pre and post this act stayed the same. Termination of parental rights appeals However, after the Adoption and Safe Families Act, we're more likely to be upheld after, um, after the Adoption and Safe Families Act for parents with alcohol or other drug problems. And generally, this act has made it so that timely treatment of substance abuse is even more critical for families as the time that they have 
to um, get treatment and recover is much more limited and they have to prove more quickly that they are ready to have their children. There are also many policies affecting newborns. So the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA of 2010, requires that states have policies and procedures for child protection services notification and services for substance abuse new, uh, exposed newborns. So 14 states and the District of Columbia include this work for notification and services in their definition of child abuse or neglect. And seven states, including Minnesota, require a needs assessment for the newborn and their family and referral to services. Two states, Minnesota and Illinois, require mandated reporters to report when they sus suspect a pregnant woman is a substance abuser. Now, children exposed to illegal drug activity is another area of policy that affects our work in child welfare. We know that negative effects of um, substance abuse on children is a growing concern and thus there have been many new laws. Considered neglect in Minnesota is prenatal exposure to substances and subsequent fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So children who've been prenatally exposed or then have FASD are considered in our neglect statutes. Using a controlled substance that impairs a caregiver's ability to adequately care for the child's basic needs and safety is also considered neglect in Minnesota. Considered abuse, however, is giving a child alcohol or other non-prescribed substances to control or punish or resulting in otherwise unnecessary medical procedures. Considered abuse or neglect in other states, so not Minnesota, are things like manufacturing a controlled substance in the presence of a child or on the presence occupied by a child, exposing a child to or allowing a child to be present where chemicals or equipment for the manufacture of controlled substances are used or stored, and exposing a child to the criminal sale or distribution of drugs. Now, several of these things are, however, included in criminal statutes, so in Minnesota, while they're not in the child welfare statutes, several of these things are criminal. So Minnesota and 33 other states and the U.S. Virgin Islands include exposure of children to illegal drug activity in their criminal statutes. In Minnesota and 10 other states, it can, it's considered child endangerment to expose children to the manufacture, possession, or distribution of illegal drugs. And in nine states, there are even stricter penalties related to methamphetamines. So now we'll go into what works for addiction, a comprehensive literature review. So a comprehensive literature review through July 2017 looked at social work abstracts and psych info, so two of the search engines that we use to look for what does the literature say, so what research has been done, what have people published. And we looked at alcohol, drug, and addict, and other extensions of these words. So alcohol with a star would include alcoholics or alcoholism, addict with a star would be addiction, addicts, that sort of thing. And we looked and substance in the title of those articles. And then we looked at the keyword or subject heading search for child welfare and combined the two. And we found 264 publications, not including book reviews or dissertations. So looking at those by topic, We've taken this large chunk of literature and brought it to our child welfare workforce. We know you're busy. We know that you don't have time to look at all of this depth of the literature. We've sorted it by topic to help you sort of dig deeper into the things that are most interesting to you. So by topic, here are some of the areas that we've covered. Screening, interventions, both related to child welfare and substance abuse, understanding the link between substance abuse and child welfare, and there are many resources um, related to this, sort of helping you understand like why do people who abuse substances end up in the child welfare system, or how the child welfare system treats people who are substance users, that sort of thing. Then there are many areas of special populations covered in the literature, so things related to fathers, indigenous peoples and American Indians, people of color, meth users and infants, um, parenting and motherhood, 
and specific um, interventions and um, ways that our child welfare system thinks about parenting motherhood related to substance use. Trauma and the effects of trauma both for the parents and for children. Training and options for training staff, graduate students and foster parents related to substance abuse. And then outcomes. And outcomes is a huge section of the literature and it's broken down a little bit more deeply for you but to help you understand like what are the outcomes for children, for parents, for the long-term effects on children, the outcomes in the child welfare system. There are many sections in the in the outcomes area for you to look at. And another is collaborative practice between child welfare and substance abuse. And many researchers have looked at this relationship between child welfare and substance abuse systems. And then youth and adolescent substance abuse in the child welfare system. Many researchers have looked at the number and effects on adolescents who are also substance abusers themselves. So here in this next slide, I'll just summarize uh, what I feel are the core takeaway messages from this idea of what works for addiction. And the first takeaway is that what helps with addiction really depends, it really depends on the uh, factors related to the individual, the substance, and the social environment. Um, but there are three uh, primary psychosocial treatments that I focused on in the webinar. One is that cognitive behavioral strategies are used to change maladaptive thoughts and behaviors related to substance use and relapse. Motivational interviewing is used to enhance innate motivation of the individual. 12-step facilitation is used to help individuals connect with 12-step programs in the community that can support them throughout the rest of their lives as they remain in recovery optimally. And Karen Goodenough's takeaways are policy and practice interventions have been plentiful over the past 20 years in an attempt to positively impact the children and families affected by substance abuse and the child welfare system. And ensuring that all child welfare workers have knowledge of substance abuse and recovery and the effects on both parents and children is key to effectively helping families through the process of addiction and recovery. Thank you very much for uh, your kind attention to this um, series of modules. And we thank you for all the hard work you do on behalf of children and families. Um, uh, and, we, and the bibliography will be available to you as well as the summary of the research that I described that will also be available to you. So what follows on the following slides are the bibliography for this series of, of webinars. Thank you again.